Pastor Carter, welcome to our Fresh Hot Potatoes program. Thank you. Uh, what do you mean by fresh hot potatoes? Is that an oxymoron? Can you have fresh and hot at the same mm. time? Well, I'll have to think about that for a second. <laughs> um, I guess you could have hot old potatoes. Hot old potatoes. <laughs> well, Would you could have potatoes that are uh, old that you've had in the cupboard for, okay. for a week or two. You know, they're starting to sprout. Okay. And I guess you could cook them up. We are really answering the big <laughs> questions today. But no, we... we uh, but we, these ones, you know, these are being sent to us and they're, they're fresh. Yes, and we're, and being, we're being facetious because uh, we, we are mm. fresh because these are new questions. And, and some of the questions are hot. And they are hot mm. and they are coming in from our uh, internet audience too through Facebook mm. and things like that, mm. which is very exciting. Uh, we're going to get straight to the questions and uh, see what uh, you have to say and what God's Word has to say about mm -hmm. these questions. Now, a few uh, years ago, probably around three or four years ago, Dan Brown uh, wrote a book, Angels and Demons. Mm. And uh, he raised the question of the Illuminati and secret societies, mm. uh, some conspiracy stuff. Uh, are angels and demons just the stuff of conspiracy or are they mm. real? The Illuminati may be, but I don't think angels and demons um, the Bible talks about angels okay. and the Bible talks about demons. Yes. Uh, Jesus had an experience with, with the devil himself, okay. with Satan. I think that's found in Matthew chapter 4. And I take this book as it is, as the word of the Lord. Now the Bible says, Matthew 4, Jesus said to him, Matthew 4 verse 10, mm -hmm. away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. So he's the head of the demons. Yes. And verse 11 says, then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Now, Pastor Venegas, the Bible talks about a tremendous battle that took place eons ago. Yes. And the forces of God were right against the forces of Lucifer. And the Bible talks about the good angels and the evil angels. Okay. And the Bible says that the evil angels with Satan were cast out and thrown down to this earth. Mm -hmm. Now, it sounds like uh, fantasy. Do you, see, do you see it actually playing out in the world around us? Absolutely. This battle of good and yeah, evil? Yeah, absolutely. I believe in the concept of evil. Okay. Now, many philosophers before 9-11 did not believe in the concept of evil. Yeah. After 9-11, they said, yes, there is evil in the world. Yes. And if there is evil in the world, we believe it comes from a vast evil source. Yes. Yes. And the Bible says that evil source is a person by the name of Lucifer, who was also called Satan. Yes, yes. Uh, now, that, that is a theological question about mm. good and evil. Uh, there's another very interesting question, and this comes from uh, Desmond. And he asks, do you believe in the rapture, uh, an idea believed by millions? Now, I would understand the rapture mm. uh, by being, um, being mm. the pre-tribulation rapture that yeah. is believed by dispensationalists. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us first what, they say, what, what it is? Uh, many Christians in the United States, well, around the world, but particularly here, yes. believe that Jesus is going to come somewhat in secret. Yes. And the saints of God are going to be raptured home to glory and the wicked are going to be left to populate this earth. They're going to stay on this earth. Yes. Um, but doesn't the Bible confirm that? Matthew 24, it says two men will be working in a field. One will be taken, the other one will be left. Uh, mm -hmm. Luke 17 says there, two will be in a bed, there, one taken, one left. Yeah, there will be. There will be. Yes. Um, one, is, one is taken home to glory and the other is left here upon this earth. Okay. There is a time of separation. Yes. But the Bible doesn't teach the idea of a secret coming of Christ. Okay. Um, this is simply fantasy. I don't think there's any real theologian who believes in the, in the secret rapture. Uh, and yet it's a prevailing Christian mm. view. I heard someone say, um, a great scholar say, that the only people who believe in the secret rapture are people who are employed by organisations that teach it. Okay. <laughs> but people who are not employed by those organisations, yes. but who are free to think for themselves yes. and to study the Bible for themselves, do not believe in this idea. So what does the Bible actually uh, teach? Let me read you a text on, um, on the coming of Christ, or as they would call it, the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 and 17. 
18, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, uh, with the voice of the archangel, very noisy, Mm -hmm. and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Yes. And so we will be with the Lord forever. The Bible teaches, Pastor Benegas, mm-hmm. that when Jesus comes back, there's a tremendous noise. Yes. There's the voice of the archangel. There's the trumpet call of God. It doesn't seem to be something, you know, subdued and quiet and secret. And the Bible says the dead in Christ are raised first. And then it says that the saints of God living on the earth are taken home to glory. And so the rapture of the saints or the taking home of the saints to glory takes place when the resurrection, the literal resurrection of the dead takes place. So really the rapture is to be caught up. So, yes, it is. So we do believe in the rapture. In a biblical sense. In a biblical sense. But not in their theological sense. Is, is it that harmful of you? What, what's the negative really? Um, these are good questions. And in fact, in fact, these are some of your questions, but that's okay. That's, <laughs> All right, but look, okay. <laughs> how, how about the fact that uh, biblical truth let, let me, yeah, let, yeah. Let, let, let me talk about this. There are things that are, are, are taught in the rapture that are, are correct, that yes. the rapture is going to happen soon. Yes. Christians believe that they're living in the last days. Those who believe in the rapture believe that we're living in the, in the day of judgment. Yes, which is good. But there's a great heresy because it has the saints of God, God's people being saved from the great tribulation. Yeah, yeah. In Russia during the last century, this idea was taught and they were told, no, you won't get persecuted yes. because you're going to be raptured home before the persecution comes. Yes. But tens of millions of Christians died. Yes. Yeah. But in this part of the world and in some other parts of the world, the Christians are raptured from the trouble and they're taken home to glory. Yes. So it's a wonderful doctrine if you don't want persecution yeah. and nobody does want it. Yes. But the problem is it says that the rest of the people are left on this earth. And during this time, the Antichrist rules for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then in Jerusalem, after three and a half years, he puts an end to the sacrifice and the offering. And so the Antichrist actually comes after, after, after the second coming. But the Bible teaches that the great test for the people of God and the great time of persecution happens before, before the second coming. And so again, it's about... Oh, it's a world of difference. It's the Bible and what yes. the Bible teaches, yes. not uh, Darby with his Schofield Bible yes. or Hal Lindsay with his late great yes. planet Earth. Yes. It's the teachings of the Bible. Mm-hmm. On that same thing, um, we have another question here from uh, a lady called Ellen. Uh, should believers leave the cities that are centres of crime, sexual perversion, and lawless, lawlessness. Does the Bible teach that we should remove ourselves from the cities in, in these days? A very good question, and one that is being asked by, by Christians over and over. Yeah. Uh, I've, heard, I've had people come to me after a church service, and they've said, do you think the cities are going to be destroyed? Should yes. we get out of the cities? It's a valid question. Uh, well, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty severe talk, isn't it? Mm. But the Bible does say in Jude in verse seven, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. Mm -hmm. They serve as, as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Now, I think I've been to the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. I've been there on a number of occasions with television crews. That's on the southeastern side of the Dead Sea. There are some little cities that have been discovered there by the name, one city is Numira. And you actually see ash that is two meters, six feet thick. And in the ash, actual little pieces of human bone. I've let the ash run through my fingers and I've actually felt the human bone. 
are people who most likely died in that catastrophe yes. that destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah about 4,000 years ago. James, yes. it's just as well that Lot got out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes. It's just too bad that Mrs. Lot looked back, but it's just, it was a bad thing when Lot decided to live in those cities of great perversion. I believe that the time is coming when the people of God are going to say, because of the tremendous sin in the cities, because of the tremendous crime, they need to get away from those places, maybe get out in the country. I'm not talking about a, a mass exodus with hysteria where people run up into the hills and they starve to death up there. I'm not suggesting that, but I think people ought to consider slowly, methodically, leaving these great centres of sin and evil because judgment is coming upon them. So in your opinion, the Bible does teach that we need to consider Uh, this. I think we should consider it, yes. Now, Pastor Carter, there's uh, some other interesting questions Mm -hmm. that I'm going to ask you in just a moment, especially about men in our society and Uh young men. I'm Mm -hmm. interested to hear your opinion Mm -hmm. on it. But first, we must take a few moments to listen to this very important message. And welcome back to Fresh Hot Potatoes with Pastor John Carter. These potatoes are very fresh and hot at the same time. Uh, we've just been speaking about the, uh, the crimes and the city, the, the, the crimes in our cities and the perversion, the importance of considering not being uh, stuck in these cities and moving away. But we have some other questions here, one from Sylvia that talks about not just the cities, but how about the gender roles in the men in these cities and in our society. She says, uh, this is Sylvia, what is happening to our men, especially uh, our young men? I I would imagine um, across the board, across the world, Mm. what's happening to our young men? A a friend of mine, Trafford Fisher in Australia, in Sydney, wrote an article on this very subject. I read it the other night, what's happening to our young men? It says, the article says that these young men seem to have lost their identity. Okay. Um, they don't seem to have uh, masculine attributes. Um, there's something going on with young men. Of course, the men are into the crime more than the women. Yes. They live, they have a shorter duration of, of their lives. Uh, they commit suicide more. Okay. And so there is a crisis. Many people tell us, among the males in our society. Uh, Pastor Venegas, I think the women's lib movement did some good and it did some bad. It taught men and women that they were exactly the same. I read an article in one of the American publications, I think it was yesterday or the day before, about men sexting. You know, they send these messages to females. Yes. But the article said the women are sending the, the, the sexting, they're sexting the same as the men because there's something happened to the women. The women have become like the men okay. and the men have become like the women. So, so give me some other examples. I'm intrigued. I'm a young man. Uh-huh. In what way uh, is this playing out? Uh, we're not am- as masculine as what you would have seen in the past? Um, I don't know what Sylvia had in mind when she <laughs> asked this question. Yeah. But it's not just what I am saying, yes. but across this country, pastors, yes. uh, you'll notice this as a pastor, psychologists, sociologists are saying there's a crisis of identity among yes. males. Uh, that is why some of them get together on weekends and beat drums and, yes. and they try to do things that are, are masculine. Now, yes. of course, beating a drum is not necessarily masculine. So maybe you're talking about headship in the family or headship in the home? Uh, I, think, I think many would, would include this. Okay. Um, now, there was a time when men knew, knew their role in society. Okay. But many men today don't know their role in society. Okay. Um, I believe, I'm pretty old fashioned, of course, because I'm an old guy, but I believe that the Bible teaches that a man ought to be the the spiritual, not ruler, but the spiritual leader of his family. Yes. 
uh, he ought to be the person who says, well, you know, let's study the Bible together. Yes. And uh, the wife ought to be the co-head yes. and they ought to do this. Yes. But so often today, uh, James, it seems to me in my experience, there's a blending of the sexes. Yeah. Uh, this is why for one reason we have same sex. Yeah. Yeah. Same sex marriage. Yeah. Well, what's the difference? Yeah. Uh, women, women, men, men. I mean, it's, there's, there's a gray area. Yes. But the Bible teaches that God made men to be men and women to be women. So, and again, we're talking about- And there's about, a difference. Again, we're talking about the watering down, the perversion of God's ideal. Yes, yes. That is uh, really indicative of our times. Uh, a totally different question, Pastor Carter, uh, mm. from uh, Jimmy. He asks, uh, does God heal the sick uh, always, sometimes, or never? I guess the Bible talks a lot about healing and Jesus uh, healing. Yes. Does that stuff mm. still happen today? Yes, healing does happen today, but this will surprise many of the people who are watching the telecast. You don't have that many miracles in the Bible. Okay. You have them in Genesis 1 when God makes the world. Yeah. That's a big miracle, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. And then you go for thousands of years and then you have the flood. Mm -hmm. That's a big miracle. There doesn't seem to be much in between. No, no, no. It's just and then you come... Uh, you know, a vast period of time then, you come to the days of the Exodus when God brings the people of God out of Israel. Yes. Then you've got a, a surge of miracles. Yes. They don't last for too long. Uh, you don't read about too many miracles in the 40 years in the yes. wilderness. Yes. And then you go for a long, long, I'm just trying to remember, you go for a long period of time and you come to Elijah. Yes. And then you've got a little period of time of miracles. But then... You go for hundreds of years and you come to the days of Daniel. Uh, he saves the people who are in the, in the fire. Yes. And he saves Daniel down in the lion's den. Yes. But, you know, just a little period of time. Daniel was probably, he lived 80 years or so or 90 years and you've only got one or two miracles. Yes. And then you go for hundreds and hundreds of years and you come to the days of Jesus. Yes. And then for three and a half years, you have a a tremendous surge like the afterburners come on and the church is lifted up yes. into space. Yes. And you have miracles in the book of Acts. But then Paul writes a few years later, he says, I've left so-and-so sick. Yes. He said, I've been sick myself. Yes. yes. What happened to the miracles? The miracles seem to get less and less. Okay. Uh, the miracles are the afterburners to lift the church rocket into orbit. Yes. But once the church is in orbit, God doesn't use the afterburners. So what you're saying is that uh, by default, God doesn't uh, intervene all the time. No, He does not. But there are occasions, special mm. occasions. And in the very last days, yes. during the latter rain, the Bible says you're going to have the afterburners turned on again. Okay, okay. Uh, but the Bible is not written as a book to teach us to trust in some burst of, of supernatural energy. Yes. I don't believe in those churches where the preacher says, you know, we're going to heal everybody here tonight. I yes. don't believe in this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't believe, I've, I've studied it. I've seen the after effects of it. Those people get the same diseases. Yes. They have the same funerals. Yeah. They go to the same hospitals. And somebody has said about one of the world's most famous faith healers, why doesn't he go to a big hospital yeah, and, just heal and cure the people with cancer? <laughs> yes. Why doesn't he make the blind people to see? Yes, yes. Have yes. you ever heard of a blind person actually being healed? Yeah. And a doctor comes along later and he says, yes, yeah, yeah, I read about it in the Bible. Yes. But so, I don't read about it by the faith preachers. So should we still pray for healing? Yes, those? we do. Okay. Because God sometimes says, yes. Mm -hmm. I've seen this in Russia where a person was dying of cancer, was miraculously healed. Yes. I came back to perform the, the funeral and the person was there to welcome me, oh completely God. healed. Wow. That was in Russia. Yes. I haven't seen that too often, but I saw a man come in Nizhny, Novgorod, who, who could, could hardly breathe. Yes. And he came, came to the meeting. His name was Vadim, as a hunchback. Yes. And as I was preaching one night, he was healed. Wow. Wow. Whenever I go to Russia, I've been there 42 times, yes. he runs to me and he hugs me. And he shouts, he's been healed. Yes. God sometimes says, yes. Yes. Often he says, uh, wait a while. Sometimes he says, no. But James, Pastor Venegas, listen yes. to me. There's, we can guarantee 
every person watching the telecast, that every person is going to be healed who trusts in Jesus. Yes, yes. So That's really, when Jesus comes. So, so really what we're saying is that uh, healings do happen. Yes. But it's up to God when they happen. Yes, but it's we the should, sovereignty of God. But we should still ask mm. because uh, He does intervene. There's plenty of evidence for that. I'm looking forward to a big healing one day. Yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. Now, uh, moving along, I have a, a question. We're running out of time uh, yeah. right now. Um, what, what is the big difference, Graham asks, what is the big difference between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism? Mm. Now, it might seem obvious to some, but uh, maybe not to others in, mm. in, in our day and age. Uh, uh, what, let, what is the difference between the two? Let me give you a quick answer. And if you want to, we can talk about it in the next program. Yes, we will. Protestants believe in the principle of sola scriptura. Yes. That means only scripture. We don't get our doctrines from some other writers. We believe in sola scriptura. Yes. We don't believe in the teachings of the church fathers. The Church of Rome believes in the teaching of the church fathers. Mm-hmm. Purgatory, all of those doctrines. Papal infallibility, not in the Bible. Number two, sola Christos, yes. only Christ. We are saved only by Christ, not yes. saved by the church, yes. not saved by the priest, not saved by the pastor, not yes. saved by the, the Pope. Christ, sola Christus, sola gratia, only grace, yes. sola fide, only faith. Yes. And do we have a priest? Do I believe in confessing my sins to the priest? Yes, I do. Jesus. Yes. Jesus is my priest, not a priest in Rome or a priest in the church. I confess my sins not to you, yes. but to Christ. Therefore, first and foremost, I am a Christian. Yes. Secondly, I am a Protestant. Yes. So really what, uh, what we're saying here is, uh, where is the authority? Where is the authority? Is it in man-made rules and no. laws or in the Bible? That's what it means to be a Protestant, is that correct? Now, some Protestants, of course, have a church with a hierarchy yes. and they have committees that act like little popes. Yes. And they give uh, statements which are sort of ex cathedra. Yes. But we do not discover truth by going to a committee. Yes. We do not discover a truth by going to a group of men. Yes. We go according to sola scriptura. Yes. And so you are a Bible preacher, thanks be to God. Yes. And I'm a Bible preacher. So when I preach, I preach from the Bible. Yes. Because I am a Protestant Christian who believes in the coming of the Lord. That makes me an Adventist. Yes. And so I am a Christian Protestant, Adventist. So in all of the matters that we've been discussing, we're talking about angels and demons, the rapture. Mm. We're talking about the role of men, the healing. It really all boils down to that. Mm. Where is our authority? Where Mm. do we get our answers? How do we know how to live our lives? And so Pastor Carter, we want to thank you uh, once again for your time, for answering these questions. Again, we want to remind our viewers that our website, carterreport.org or carterreport.org is the website where you can leave your questions. Uh, You can also seek answers. We have video, we have audio there where Pastor Carter has answered previous questions, but we'd like to hear more fresh hot potato questions from our viewers out there. We thank you, Pastor Carter, for your time. We thank you for watching. God bless you and we'll see you next time.